Welcome back to Grimm's Frightmares. I'm your host, Joshua D. Maley. Few things are as interesting as the technological progress of mankind. Long before luxuries like cell phones and tablets, we were innovating in very remarkable ways. From ancient architectural wonders to feats of incredible engineering, such as man-made lakes and reservoirs to bring water to areas that didn't get very much of it naturally. In fact, there are dozens of these lakes all over the United States. But at what cost were these marvels created? Tonight's story comes to us from a listener in an undisclosed town in New England, where the creation of such a man-made lake resulted in an entire town being submerged, with the surrounding hillsides becoming small islands. And among these islands is where we find the Island of the Dead. I've spent much of my life on or around water. I grew up on the banks of the Ohio River in Pennsylvania. My family had a cabin near Raystown Lake in central Pennsylvania, and we made yearly visits to either Lake Erie or Atlantic City, both of which obviously included trips to their respective beaches. Now, mind you, I wasn't a boater, not exactly, but I did enjoy spending time on the lake, out in the ocean, or just being around or near the beach in general. Despite that, I'd never visited what you'd consider a man-made body of water. Honestly, I didn't even know it was a thing, although I guess it doesn't seem like too ridiculous an idea. But when I learned from my cousin Stephanie about Crestwood Cove, man, the idea fascinated me. Stephanie's family lived in New England, in a place where there wasn't a lot of natural water sources. At some point in the 1950s, the government got the idea to dam up part of the Nashua River to create this huge lake that could be used for irrigation, water supplies for nearby towns, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the area that would best suit this lake was already occupied by the little town of Crestwood. So the government did what it does, which is buy up the town, tore down what could be torn down, relocated cemeteries, things like that, and then they flooded it. And when I had the chance to see this wonder for myself, I was all over it. I had just graduated high school. My parents decided to go and visit Steph's family before I went off to college. I was so pumped to finally see this place that she'd been talking about all these years. The evening of our first day there, I finally had the chance. After dinner, Steph and I took a walk through the woods behind their house, which led all the way to the shore of Lake Crestwood. It was chilly, even though it was early June. I guess that's kind of a thing in New England. Once the sun went down, the temperature dropped even more, from the 70s down to the 50s. Still, it didn't take us too long to get to the lake. The forest we passed through was dark even before the sun set, and it got a lot worse after. It was a thick forest, lots of ancient big old trees with massive trunks and tons of branches that got all crisscrossed and tangled up above our heads. There was definitely a sense of, well, something in that forest. I don't know, history maybe? Or just the sense that, Something might have happened there, which I guess technically is the same thing. When we emerged from the woods, there wasn't much open ground left before we hit the shore of the lake. The water was dark, the sun was gone, the moon was nowhere to be seen, so all it could really reflect on the surface of the water was the night sky. Big lazy gray clouds rolled over our heads, branches behind us rushed as a cool breeze kind of settled in, coming off the lake. Crestwood looked like pretty much any other lake I'd seen. Nothing really stood out about it. It was a decent size, but I thought I could see the other shore visible just in the distance. Not as big as I thought it would be, I said. Steph explained that what I could see in the distance was one of like a half a dozen other small islands that dotted the lake. They were areas that were too high up or too much trouble to try and bring down whenever they built the lake. There's a whole forest down there. They had to cut off the tops of the trees so the boats wouldn't hit them. Actually, half the town is still down there. Streets, buildings, everything. I took in the lake and the stories and felt an uncomfortable chill creeping up my back. A fog was rolling in off the water, which seemed odd for this weather. It happens all the time. There's tons of ghost stories about the town down there. I'll tell you about them tomorrow. Maybe we can take my dad's boat out and go fishing. I like the sound of that. Steph turned to head back, but my gaze lingered on the lake, now nearly covered in fog. I took out my phone and snapped a few pictures, though I knew they'd be way too dark to see anything. I glanced down to the water before me, and for a split second, 
I could have sworn I saw something looking back at me. It was just for the briefest second, and it looked like an eye. Just all white, no pigment or pupil or anything, just kind of glazed over. It was enough to make me do a double take, but it was gone in an instant. I found myself wondering if it had ever been there in the first place. I guess even if it had been, it probably was just a fish or something. I mean, that must have been it. What else would it have been? I ended up crashing on the couch that night, but I had a hard time getting to sleep. My mind kept wandering back to the lake, to the creepy weird eye that I thought I'd seen looking at me. I kept it to myself all the next day, but I think Steph knew something was up. When we finally decided to head back out to the lake just before lunch, she asked me about it. You saw something last night, didn't you? I shrugged. I don't know, maybe. It was probably a fish or something. It was just under the water. It was gone in like a second. It just got into my head a bit, I think. You know, with all the ghost story stuff we were talking about. She let it go, but I could tell it was still kind of on her mind. We ended up taking a different path through the woods this time, emerging a little bit to the east of where we were before. A simple wooden dock jutted out into the lake, and an overturned aluminum boat rested on the lakeshore. Steph and I dropped our gear and flipped the boat, then loaded it and pushed it into the water. She manned the oars and showed me how to use them. We took turns paddling out to the island that I had seen the previous night. During one of her turns, I sat gazing at the water beneath us, watched as the ripples drifted out from where the oars broke the tension of the surface. Somewhere in those dark, unseen depths were the remnants of a town. The idea was kind of thrilling, but also terrifying. I mean, who knew what was really down there, or what it looked like by now? It was way over 50 years ago. The island loomed before us at last, a mass of mud and rocks and more of those ancient massive trees with the huge trunks. I saw where Steph was guiding us, to a small outcropping of land between two huge boulders. The forest on the island seemed even thicker than the one we had just left behind, which was now barely visible in the distance back behind us. We grounded the boat just between those two rocks. There was no dock to tie off to, so we pulled the boat onto the shore, took our gear out, and then flipped it over and laid the oars next to it. Just behind us, not far from the shore, was a fire ring and the long, cold remnants of someone else's campfire. You guys come out here often? Not for a while. It's probably from the last time. We can use it, though. We spent the day setting up the fire ring, getting some wood from the trees on the edge of the forest, scouring for some dry kindling, then unpacking our gear. We broke for lunch of cold-cut sandwiches and coffee from a thermos, then finally got our fishing gear out and headed down to the beach to find a good spot. It took Steph a few minutes to get oriented, but she led us to what she thought would probably be the best place on the island, based on past experience, and we settled into fish. I broke out some cold sodas and settled into my chair, less interested in actually fishing and more interested in just relaxing and watching the water gently lap against the shore. So what's up with this town down there? There's just a lot of bad stuff that happened, even before it was a lake. My pap lived there. He said that there was a lot of sicknesses and weird deaths in town. He always said they chose a spot for the lake to drown out all the bad memories. Stephanie went on to tell me about her grandfather's stories, about how they didn't actually move the graves in the graveyards. Just the headstones. Like something out of a horror movie. She said there were a lot of accidents there once they started filling in the lake. A lot of people falling down into the valley, malfunctioning equipment, missing workers. According to the stories, some of the people were never found, which means they're still down there at the bottom of the lake somewhere. She also mentioned some boating accidents that were more recent, like how in the previous year a family's boat got caught on one of the tree stumps that was in the shallower part of the lake. They didn't cut it down low enough and it tore the boat open and the entire family ended up drowning. Lots of bad things happening there. And my only thought was, here we are, in the middle of all that, going fishing. Awesome. I've never seen anything out here. We drifted into a pleasant silence then as I considered everything she just told me. Underwater graveyards where the bodies were still down there. That sounded like something out of a movie. The more I considered it, the more uneasy I actually felt about it. I wasn't sure why, it just felt off there. The sun eventually sank towards the western horizon, and I found myself more than ready to head back to the firing. 
something about the island definitely didn't feel right. I mean, I didn't believe in ghosts or anything. I figured it was probably just Stephanie's story getting inside my head. Still, it felt to me as though we were stranded there on that small island, surrounded by death and darkness. We didn't catch any fish that night by the time we decided to head back. I didn't care, I was just eager to get the fire going. It was going to be a cold night for sure, even colder than last night. When we got there, I was dismayed to see that our fire ring had been vandalized. I had already set up the wood we were going to use in the fire ring, teepee style with some kindling underneath it. But when we came back, the wood had been moved, placed in what looked at the time like completely random patterns all around the campsite. Real cute, Steph. You didn't tell me your neighbors were jerks. Without a word, Steph hurried to the two boulders on the beach where our boat was. I joined her. The boat was untouched, and there was no sign that anyone else had landed there. No tracks, no footprints, nothing. Who could have done this? Maybe they landed somewhere else. Come on, let's fix it so we can have some heat. It took about a half hour to clean up the mess the visitors had left, and probably another 15 minutes before I had the fire burning hot enough to give us some warmth. With each passing moment, my mind was screaming at me to get going. Just forget the fire. Just go back to the shore. Get back into the house. It's just nerves, I thought. Someone's screwing with us and it has me on edge. All this stuff has me on edge. And the truth was, I'd been on edge since getting off the boat. As Steph and I huddled around the fire, letting our hot dogs cook on the small roasting sticks I'd carved for us, I took stock of our surroundings. To the south were the boulders that marked our spot where we came ashore. To the north and east was more or less flat ground that led to the beach we'd fished at. To the west, that forest loomed above us, its towering pines reaching upwards for what seemed like an eternity. The sound of a mournful howl split the air around us. We looked to each other, wide-eyed. It's probably just a coyote. Out here? How? What would it eat? How would it even get out here? There was a shuffling sound near the forest, as if someone or something, were running. I couldn't see anything much beyond the first few trees. The forest interior was black as pitch. Cold sweat formed on my brow. I wiped it off and grabbed my phone, turning on its LED flashlight feature. I'm going to see what that was, I said. I still think someone's messing with us. Just stay here. Steph didn't seem to like that idea, judging by the fear in her eyes, but she did it just the same. I pulled my hoodie tighter and walked towards the woods slowly, my trembling hand shining an unsteady beam of light from my phone. From somewhere ahead of me came whispering. Soft voices talking all at once, overlapping. I froze in place for a moment, and so too did the voices. As I inched towards the forest, the voices seemed to inch ahead as well. I glanced back at Steph. She was on her feet next to the fire, watching me. Against my better judgment, I turned and entered the forest. The voices remained ahead of me, always sounding just about the same distance away. I followed them as best I could, turning and moving as they turned and moved. Before long, I had completely lost track of where I was in the forest. And that was the moment the voices vanished. I spun around wildly as the wind picked up, the cold slicing right through my hoodie as if I weren't even wearing it. The sounds of movement surrounded me again. Rustling branches, footsteps, my heart was in my throat. I chose a direction and ran. As small as the island was, it felt like the forest went on forever. My stomach turned sour as I sensed the presence of someone, or maybe many someones, in the forest with me. I ran in a straight line this time, hoping eventually, eventually, I would come out the other side and make it through the woods. And I did. When I did finally break out, it was on a part of the island I didn't recognize right away. I emerged and nearly ran straight into the water. Beneath the inky blackness below me, I saw it again. A single eye, glazed in white, a glow with some kind of ethereal light drifted in the water before me, somehow under the surface, yet I could see it clearly. A companion soon joined it, and the blackness seemed to coalesce around them, 
forming what I can only describe as a human silhouette. This was joined by a second, then a third. Within moments, the lake seemed to glow. The blackness now formed into dozens of, of people, now all moving towards me. I turned back to the forest, but stopped short at a similar sight. From deep within the forest, the shadows seemed to shift and shape around glowing pairs of eyes, all burning that same pale yellow as the ones in the water. I stood rooted to that spot, unable to move or breathe or think. It wasn't until I heard my name that I found I could move again. I whipped my head around and saw Stephanie further down the beach, waving me on. I realized then I had emerged on the northern side of the island, not that far from the campfire. I glanced back to the water and found it dark once more. No trace of the ghostly eyes or figures or anything else. The forest was silent as well. I backed away and ran like hell back to Stephanie. What did you see? I didn't answer. I went straight for the boat and flipped it the hell over. Steph seemed to understand my intent. All right, I'll go get our stuff. As I readied the boat, she hurried back and grabbed the essentials from around the campfire. We boarded and I rowed the entire way back, drawing from a reserve I didn't even think was possible. It would be a few days before I explained to Steph what I thought I had seen. It chilled her as well. We never went back to the island, and almost five years on now, I have yet to even go back and visit Steph. We'll keep in touch online, but I won't be going back to Lake Crestwood anytime soon. Or ever. Thanks so much for joining us for the start of the third season of Grimm's Frightmares. It's great to be back. We look forward to sharing new stories and new narrators with you as the season goes along. If you liked what you heard, please hit like and subscribe. And don't forget to ring the bell to make sure that you get all of our latest updates. You can check us out on other social media sites as well. Just follow the links in the description below. Special thanks to my daughter Alyssa for joining me on this story. We'll be hearing more from her later this season. In the meantime, happy October, everyone. Stay safe and stay scary.